Well, I've already mentioned to you that <clears throat> we're going to be looking at just really one passage, one, one verse. And it's just the one thing that David was desiring to do as he would enter into, which in his day would be the place of worship, which was the, the tabernacle, the tent that was pitched in order to meet with the Lord. That's where the symbol of his presence was. It was not nearly as ornate as the, um, the temple would later be. But still, David desired to see the emblems of God's presence and to see something of his glory. And that's what we need to be seeking after as well. Psalm 27, verse 4. David writes, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Uh, notice one thing I have asked. David placed this above everything else that he desired in life. This is what he wanted. He wanted to be in the place where God reveals himself so he could see his glory. And that, I'll submit to you, is really what is in the heart of every true believer. They want to see the glory of the Lord, but again, the desire to do that is going to be greater or less depending upon how powerfully the Holy Spirit's working in us, and that's going to depend upon how well we are fighting the battle that we are engaged in. So remember, we're looking at this from the perspective of spiritual warfare, and so far we have seen that we are all involved in this battle. I mean, we're involved in it whether we realize it or not. This battle, as we've seen, is not a physical battle, though sometimes it looks that way because of the people that are involved in it, we're, you know, it, it often involves people. It looks like people are coming against us. But it's really a spiritual kingdom behind the people in their hearts and, of course, motivating them to do the things that they do. We've seen that there is a very real person who is evil, a spiritual being who is called the devil. He's not fictional, but he is real. And he hates God. He hates his kingdom, he hates everything about him, and he hates us as well because we are made in his image. He particularly hates those that belong to him because we are becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, because he hates us, he wants to destroy us, and he would succeed in destroying us. He's going to destroy many people who don't come to Jesus Christ, but he cannot destroy us. He would succeed, though if it weren't for God's grace. But since he can't destroy us, we've seen, he's doing everything he can to try to weaken us so that we'll be less of a threat to him and to his kingdom. Now, sometimes we may not realize that the things that we are experiencing in our own lives that are keeping us from moving forward in our growth into the image of Jesus Christ are really his attacks against us. And I'm just, instead of always sort of distinguishing where this attack is coming from. Let's just say it's all being orchestrated by the devil, but we do understand that we have an internal enemy, we have an external enemy, and the external enemy is working with our internal enemy to try to get us to fall. So he's attacking us, and if we want to overcome him, we do need to understand how he does this. Now, so far we've seen, just by way of quick review, that he will try to question what God says, what God clearly says. That's how he approached Eve. Remember how he got her to fall. If he can deceive us into thinking that what God says is bad, is something that is really good, then he can get us to fall. So he'll try to twist God's word. Sometimes he'll add to the word. Sometimes he'll take away from the word because he knows that if he can confuse us as to what the word of God says, he can defeat us. And again, I would remind you to consider or remember what it is he's done to Mormons, JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Roman Catholics. Each one of them are guilty of adding to the Word of God, and by adding to the Word of God, they have taken away something that is essential to the gospel. And because they don't have the true gospel, they're still in danger of God's judgment. Why did that happen? Why did they do that? Well, it's because of the enemy coming against them to destroy them because he hates them. Now, we've also seen that that is the danger of the charismatic movement. They believe the revelatory gifts still continue, and when they exercise these things and speak in the name of the Lord, the potential is there to change what God says. 
and also the potential, of course, is there to rely on what they think God is saying inside of them rather than what he is saying in his word. Now, I can say that from experience because I was a part of that movement for many years and I know how it works. I've seen, I've seen what happens. Not everyone is guilty of it, but the tendency is there. And by the way, we can do the same thing without being charismatic when we substitute opinion for what God says. We need to be careful that we don't, you know, listen to what people say rather than what the Word of God says. We need to be like the Bereans, always examining or comparing what we're hearing with what we're seeing in the Word of God. We've seen the devil also tries to take away our love for the Word of God, our faith in God's Word. Now, he cannot do this directly because these things come from the Holy Spirit, but he can do them indirectly, either by tempting us to fall into sin, getting us to fall into sin, quenching the Spirit, or by keeping us away from the things that will strengthen the Spirit's influence in our lives. So if he can make us doubt God's words, if he can distort it by adding or taking away from it, it's more likely he's going to be able to lead us into sin. And if he can get us to fall into sin, as well as keep us away from the means of grace, not only will he weaken our love for God and so our desire to serve the Lord, and that's a major victory if he can do that, he can also weaken our faith and by so doing, take away a large part of our motivation to serve the Lord. Because the more we see through faith of the Lord, the more we'll love Him and the more we'll want to serve Him. Faith not only brings us into a relationship with, with God, with the Father, through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it enables us to see what God is like. It enables us to see His glory and His beauty. And it also enables us to see what it is he has done for us, and he's actually done quite a bit for us. Now, both of these things will strengthen our love, and both of them then will strengthen our motivation to give ourselves more to him. Now, today what I'd like us to do is consider that Satan is working very hard also to hide God's glory and to hide his blessings from us. Now this morning I want us to consider that he is working to hide God's glory. Uh, this evening we'll look at the fact that he's hiding God's blessings. Now we usually think about, when we think about God, we think about his blessings and those are the things that motivate us. You know, he sent his son, he saved us and all of these things that are involved, all the things that he gives to us, all the things that are in store for us, all the things that he saved us from, those are all very important. But we want to make sure that we don't mistake the love for the gifts that God gives to us with a love for the giver of the gifts. We need to love Him and not just for the gift, but for who He is. That's what we want to think about this morning, God's glory. We need to love Him for who He is. Now, we know that Satan cannot hide God's existence I mean, we, we were reminded on Wednesday that God has provided irrefutable evidence in the creation that he exists. But Satan is working very hard even to discredit this and to try to hide it from our view. But he can try to hide what God has revealed of himself in the scriptures. The things, above all, really, that we know about God that make him to be lovely, that make him to be beautiful, that make him to be desirable. Now, if I were to ask you what those things are, do you think you could tell me what they are? And if you can't tell me what they are, should we assume that Satan has succeeded to a certain degree in hiding those things from us? Satan is very good at what he does. So I want us to spend a few moments reflecting on these things. And again, we really need the Spirit's work to show us this glory of God, um, particularly the one that makes him most glorious, which is his holiness. Now, we do need to begin, uh, we need to understand as we begin that there, there are two aspects to God's beauty. The first one is really more objective. It's what we call maybe the objective aspect of his beauty, that God really is a perfect, beautiful and glorious being. 
Okay? He is. Whether we see it or not, that's what he is. The second one is more subjective, and that is our ability to be able to appreciate that beauty. I think we'd all admit something might be beautiful, but we, if we can't see it, we're not going to find, our, you know, we're not gonna see, find it to be so, right? I mean, we might see a rainbow, and we might think that rainbow is beautiful if we can see it, but the people who can't see it will never be able to appreciate that beauty because they are blind to it. Now, we've already noted before that the ability to see God's perfections as something that is good, something that is desirable, something that is beautiful, is really a matter of the heart. I've already given you, uh, well, th this is really, you know, let's say we see it, but we all have differing views of what it actually looks like, whether it's beautiful or not. You've heard the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty can be subjective as well as objective. Now, most people who look at God, who consider who God is, as he reveals himself in the Bible, most people, most of the people who even have read it or know anything about it, find him to be unattractive. Uh, many very much so. Uh, think about Richard Dawkins. Uh, I was really blown away by this, and it's, what, what he says is, is blasphemous, but it's an example of how people view God. Richard Dawkins, as you know, is an atheist, and his mission in life is to try to get uh, everyone to be liberated from religion. You need to see this fictional character you call God uh, as he really is. And so this is how he paints him in his book, The God Delusion, was quoted in that uh, documentary that was made, which I would recommend to you. It's uh, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. A very interesting uh, documentary. It's, it's in our library. But anyway, he says this about him, and of course, uh, Ben Stein calls him into question for this. He says, the God of the Old Testament, this is Dawkins, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Notice he doesn't believe God exists. He thinks whoever created this fictional character, he has got to be the most unpleasant person that's ever been thought of. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynist, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalo, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Okay. So here's at least um, one description of God. And, uh, of course, the question is, do we find him to be essentially what he finds him to be? Excuse me just a second. I don't know what it is with this thing, but it um, continues to just close up on me. I think the enemy doesn't want um, this particular thing to be, to be said. Okay. So here is what one unbeliever believes. And by the way, this is really what every unbeliever believes regarding God if they didn't have the restraint that God places upon them. And yet, at the same time, there are those, such as us, who look at this same God and we find him to be so beautiful that we devote our lives to serve him. Now, how is it that we see God in, in two such different ways? Well, it's because of sin. It's because of the sin in man's hearts. That's why Dawkins sees God the way he is, because evil hates what is good. God is absolute good, and so evil hates God. Now, only God's Spirit can break this blinding influence of sin and show us what God really is and what he really looks like. And when he does that, and he does do that, that's the blessing of the gospel, that's the work of the new birth, uh, of regeneration. When he does this, our hearts are drawn out to God because now we see him as he really is, not through the eyes of hatred, but rather through the eyes of love. But even after he does this, even after the Spirit opens our eyes, our sense of God's beauty 
rises or falls as the Spirit's influence in our hearts rises and falls. Now, sin is what makes the Spirit's influence fall. And that's why the devil is continually tempting us to sin. Not being in the means of grace. You know, the Word of God, prayer, as we've been talking about in worship, is what, you know, is basically makes it fall because it's not strengthening that influence of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the enemy is trying to keep us away from these things as well. So there's this ob uh, subjective side to seeing the beauty of God. The more we have of His Spirit, the more powerful His influence is, the more beautiful we're going to find Him, and the more we're going to be drawn out to Him, which is why the enemy attacks that. But what I want us to focus on for the remaining moments is this. There is also the objective side to His beauty. The object that we have in view, the things about God that make Him to be beautiful. Now, Satan not only works to hide our sense, our perception of his beauty, but he also tries to hide that beauty, that perfection, that glory itself. Now, God shows us this glory in basically two ways. He shows us his glory, his perfections, his power, all these different things in the things that he's made, and he shows us in what he has written, okay? General revelation is what he has made, and he's revealing a lot about himself. Special revelation is what he has written. Now, I've already made mention of this, but Sproul reminded us this past Wednesday that God is actively revealing himself through the world that he's made, through the cosmos. And there are things that he is showing us about himself. What are those things? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, this revelation, this self-disclosure of God is so clear that it leaves everyone in the world, atheists included, Without excuse, everybody knows that God exists. But of course, they also, because of their sin, don't want to see it. And so they use their minds to try to cover it over or to hide it or to tear it down or to destroy it. That's exactly what Dawkins is doing. But the fact that they see it and reject the God who exists that they see is why God is judging mankind. At least one of the reasons, he's judging them for all their sins. But this is the particular reason Paul singles out in Romans chapter 1. His judgments are being poured out on the wicked every day because God's revealing himself and they are not thanking him, they are not worshiping him, they don't love him, they hate him, they're trying to hide him, they're trying to put him out of their minds. Now that's one way that God reveals himself, that, that revelation is rejected by the unbelievers, but the same thing is not true of us because of God's grace. We love what we see. You know, Satan's trying to cover that up, but it's there. And when we see it, we love it. We glory in it. It's God is revealing himself in it. And it's powerful. I mean, just stand on a, you know, mountain, uh, you know, some, get up in the mountains at night and, you know, when, when there's no moon, it, it just looks like you're standing right on the edge of the universe when you see all the stars and you see the power and the wisdom of God. Okay, so that's one way he reveals himself. Satan's trying to cover that over, and he certainly does a powerful job in doing that through his, his uh, propaganda, which is called evolution, evolutionary theory. It all happened. It's a great accident. There was nothing. Suddenly there was everything, all this design, all this wonder. Everything happened purely by accident, and you're an accident. doesn't reveal God at all. That's just the sin in man's heart working in their minds to tear down the knowledge of God and to try to cover it over. But it's still there, and men are still without excuse. They may not love it, but we do. But God also reveals himself in his word. Now, as I've already said, we call this special revelation. Now, when an unbeliever has the word of God and they reject that, um, he judges them even more severely than their rejection of his you know, revelation in nature. Think about what Jesus said in those places or re regarding those places where he did 
most of his miracles and revealed most of who God is to them. And by the way, when I read this passage, he was not just doing miracles, he was preaching. And when they rejected him, listen to what he says about this, because what they did was they rejected the revelation of God given through Jesus Christ. There are serious consequences for that. Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, that's the town Jesus lived in, okay? That's where Peter lived. He had a house, mother-in-law. That's where his base of operations when he was in the north. And that's where Jesus did a great deal of his ministry. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day, which means they would have repented. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, the point is, God reveals himself even more clearly in his word, and when that revelation is rejected, you know, in the days that Jesus is the living word of God, what he revealed is, is now included in Scripture. To reject this is essentially to do the same thing as rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. When that is rejected, it, it's much more severe because God reveals himself in his word even more clearly, which is why the enemy works very hard to keep us out of the Word. Again, I would ask you, how much time do you spend reading the Bible? This, what we're doing, is not a substitute for Bible reading. You know, we all need to be in the Word of God. We all need to be learning and seeing what it is that God reveals about Himself. But the enemy is working against us to keep us away because he doesn't want us to see a number of things, but particularly to see God's beauty and His perfections because he knows this will draw us out towards him and move us to give ourselves more to him. The more beautiful something is, the more desirable that its qualities are, the more we will want it. I mean, that applies to anything, whether it's, you know, uh, for me it was chasing the, an acoustic guitar, you know, which is the one, not, not the prettiest, but the one that sounds the nicest, right? But it can apply to houses, cars, and everything. But I think a good example of this is marriage, right? Why is it that those of us who are married entered into the covenant that we did with those particular people we did, with those spouses? Why did we set ourselves apart and pledge our love and devotion to that one person for life? It's because we saw something in them that drew out our love for them. Something, you know, something in them that we knew that we could not easily live the rest of our lives without. It would feel incomplete. We would, we would be hurting because that's something that we desire. Now, that isn't always why we get married, but that's, you know, usually what happens. Now, if we can see something like that in those who are far from perfect, and we are all far from perfect, that will lead us to make a lifetime commitment to that individual, how much more will God's glory when we see it move us to give ourselves to Him. Now, that is why we came to the Lord in the first place. Okay. Again, distractions, why, where are they coming from, right? So, okay, all right. But that's why we came to the Lord in the first place, right? Is that's why we trusted Jesus that's why we wanted him as our savior. That's why we serve him now. And that's why Satan is trying to hide God's perfection from us so that we'll no longer do that. Now, what are we talking about when we're talking about God's perfections? Well, God has many of them, as you know. They're, they're his attributes. We call them, you know, again, his, his uh, characteristics, his perfections, usually use the term attributes. And he has what he has, all of them, in, in an unlimited way. 
Now, going through these in detail, of course, would take a very long time, but let's just look at each of them briefly. First of all, his natural characteristics, what kind of a being he is. He is absolutely perfect. And when we're talking about this, what we mean is how great he is. You know, we talk about the, the hymn, How Great Thou Art, okay? He is great. He is beyond our imagining. He is, he is perfect in absolutely every way. He is eternal. God never began to be. God will never cease being. He has always been and he always will be. Moses writes in Psalm 90 verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal. God is everywhere. You know, I don't know how we conceive of God's being everywhere at once, but he's not like a little bit here and a little bit there, like he's a, a human-sized sort of spirit stretched throughout the universe. That, that's not the way God is. God is fully present everywhere in every point of space. David writes in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. God is eternal. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. God has the power to do whatever he wants to do. There is nothing he cannot do if that is his will. The Lord said to Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, Is anything too difficult? For the Lord, well, the implied answer, of course, is no. Everything is infinitely easy for an infinite being. And Gabriel said to Mary uh, in Luke 1.37 when she said, you know, he announced the birth of Jesus, and she said, how can this be since I'm a virgin? He says, nothing will be impossible with God. Okay, God can do all his holy will. God knows everything. David writes in Psalm 139, verse 4, Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Do you know that God knows everything comprehensively, everything that will happen, everything that could happen under any given set of circumstances? God knows everything comprehensively and immediately. God knows how to use that knowledge to its best advantage in order to work everything together for the good of his kingdom and for our good. Daniel says in Daniel 2.20, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything or anyone for any reason. You know, he doesn't even need us. Paul said to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 24 through 25, The God who made the worlds and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. By the way, these are part of the blessings of God for which we should be grateful. But God does not need us. He doesn't need anything. He didn't need to create us. God never changes. If he did... He would no longer be perfect, but perfection doesn't change. He says in Malachi 3, 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, again, these are what we call God's, oh, we could call them his natural attributes. We could call them his metaphysical attributes. These are the things that make God great. He is perfect in every way, but, but let's just consider in closing one last attribute, one last perfection, without which none of the ones we've just looked at would make him glorious, but rather would make him monstrous, the greatest conceivable monster, and that is his limitless love. How moral thou art. This, this is essentially the source from which all his moral attributes flow. God loves what is right. He loves what is good and right with a perfect love, and he hates perfectly everything that is wrong. God is righteous. God loves to reward those who do the right thing, and he also punishes those 
who do the wrong. He's just. The psalmist writes in Psalm 97, verse 2, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. And righteousness and justice are simply two expressions of love, love for what is good, love for what is right. Uh, God is patient towards us. He's patient toward those who do what is wrong. He was patient toward us when we were doing what was wrong. God does not punish and bring to court immediately, but he gives time to repent as well as taking care of his enemies in the meantime. God is merciful. He said to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And then Jesus points to the Father as our model of, of the one we are to imitate. He says, your heavenly Father is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And he says, you are to love your enemies the way that your heavenly Father loves his enemies. God's love is so great that even when we rebelled against him and fell under his judgment, he was willing to give the one who was most precious to him in order to suffer and die so that we might live. Again, that's what the Lord's Supper reminds us of. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that, when we, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now again, just think about what God would be if he were everything we described, but he was evil rather than righteous. What if he loved evil? What if he loved wickedness? We would have someone who would be far more dangerous than the devil could ever be because he is nothing compared to God. He's a creature. He's finite. God is infinite. It's his love that adorns his whole being and makes him to be infinitely lovely. And that's the reason, by the way, why we exist and why we are saved is because of the love of God. I mean, think about how the love of God, coupled with his attributes that we've just looked at, what this means for you if you were trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. First of all, it means that his love for you is eternal. God has always loved you, and God always will love you. Remember, God doesn't learn anything new. He has always purposed to save you. He has always set his affections upon you. He has always existed. It means he's always loved you. He always will. No matter where you go, because of his presence, he will be there to watch over you. Nothing can overpower him because of his, his might and take you away from him. He will always keep you. Here, here's a really good one to think about. Nothing that you and I will ever do will ever take God by surprise and make him stop loving you because he loved you knowing in advance everything that you would do before you came to know him and even after you came to know him, God knew it all, but he still chose to send his son for you, to die for you. He still sent the gospel to you, still gave you his Holy Spirit, still brought you into his kingdom and into his family. You are not going to do something that's going to make God kick you out of his family. God already knows everything you're going to do, and he's already saved you and sealed you for that final day. God knows best how to work everything in your life for good because of his infinite wisdom. And God loves you, even though, as we've just seen, he gets absolutely nothing out of it. Now, remember, God does not need us to be here. He doesn't need us to be here to praise him. He doesn't need us to be here to worship him. He actually doesn't even need us to serve him. The reason why he calls us to do these things is because we need to do these things and because he is worthy of these things. We're the ones who benefit. God doesn't benefit. God's a full cup. God's fully blessed. God has everything he needs. He doesn't need us, but we need him. So that's why he calls us to worship him, and it's important that we do. And his love for you will never change. God's not going to get tired of you. God's not going to throw you out of his kingdom someday. He's not going to say, you know, I've had enough of this plan. I'm going to start over again. You guys just all get out of heaven and, and go into hell. God's not going to do that. He's not going to change, okay? He's always going to be there 
to take care of you. Now, I know that what usually motivates us to love God are the things that I just talked about. Those are the things we're going to explore a little bit more this evening, okay? What God does for us. But we do need to remember that God is lovely too. God is beautiful. He is glorious. And it's important for us to find Him that way, to see Him that way, because really if we, if we see Him as anything less than perfect, we're either mistaken or we don't know Him, you see. Because if we know Him, the Spirit of God will show us those perfections and we will agree with the Spirit that He is perfect. But it is important that we see them and it's important that we see His, his beauty and it's important that we see His love expressed to us and that these things stir up our hearts to love Him more. Remember what the analogy of marriage? We devoted ourselves to a, to a particular person, our spouse, for life because we saw in them something beautiful. We should see God as beautiful. Devote ourselves to Him. That's what we've done if we were believers. And then, of course, we love our spouse even more because of the love and the, and the service that they give to us. And we, of course, love and serve one another. And that makes us love them even more. Well, God is, is daily pouring out His blessings on us. And we need to love Him for those things. But Satan doesn't want us to think about those things. He wants to put them out of our minds so we're not moved to love Him and serve Him more. We need to get into the Word. We need to see these things. We need to, we, when we look at the creation, don't just look at the car going by or how angry you are at the way this guy's driving or... You know, uh, just all the things that, that can distract us. Think about God's greatness and His glory. Read about it in Scripture and particularly look at His love and His, and His holiness and let them move you to serve Him. And then finally, if you don't know Him this morning, if you don't see that beauty, if you don't know of that love, you need to come to Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus. You need to trust Him. If you do come to Him, if you do receive Him, then you will see these things. You will understand these things more clearly. Actually, we do know that it's the work of God's Spirit to open your eyes to them to begin with. So if you don't want to come to Jesus, pray that He will open your eyes so that you will come to Jesus when you see that beauty. But when you do come to Him, you'll see it even more clearly because He will fill you with His Holy Spirit and show those things to you, things that you need to see in order to follow Him. Now, tonight we're going to look further, as I've already said, at God's love toward us in the, in the past, in the present, and in the future. And it's my hope, of course, these things will strengthen us even more. But we're, what we're trying to do is dispel Satan's deception. Don't let him blind you to these things. Let your eyes be open by his word and by his Holy Spirit. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to do that.